Hey, we're in a series called Rabbi, and we're just so excited to be in the week two of that. If you haven't heard the message, feel free to jump on the podcast. I really encourage you to do that. The reason being is I think that this message is going to be really helpful for, for every single person, but I really think it's important. Uh, last week's message was really important for us as a church, because here we see Jesus climb up the side of a hill, the, the miracles are increasing, and so the crowds were increasing, the multitudes gathered around him, those that were following in the closest, his disciples were nearest to him, and at just the right moment, he sits down at the maximum impact that he can have as a teacher, and he begins to teach on the side of a hill, and he gives us this incredible message about the kingdom of God called the Sermon on the Mount. One of the most famous messages, if not the most fa famous message, and if there's any message that we need to get into us, it's the message of Jesus, the words straight from his mouth. So we know exactly what the Father thinks of us and how he's called us to live and how much we're loved and the ethics of the kingdom and what delights God's heart by this amazing Sermon on the Mount. He sits down, begins to teach these principles that are more than principles, but actual realities that can be truths in your heart. That these words, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for they shall have the kingdom of heaven, were upside down and radical words for the people listening. Because why would you say the word blessed and attach it to someone that's poor in spirit? So he attaches and connects all these things that seem like human uh, fallings or failings, looks like human weakness, and he turns it upside down to give hope to every human heart here today across all locations and to those listeners right back then 2,000 years ago. As they're sitting there, they're trying to wrap their head around it, and they cannot believe what they're hearing. Because remember, we've used the word blessed so many times in church circles, we've forgotten the meaning. Blessed means made happy by God. Isn't it awesome that we have a rabbi and a teacher that is teaching us to be happy? But if you're in some places, in some churches, or following some Christians, which I love all, all, all God's children, but to be honest, sometimes I don't want to hang around them, because sometimes Christians can be the most miserable, cynical, judgmental people on the planet. Because we've, we haven't understood what Jesus is saying. He didn't say, oh, depressed are those who are poor in spirit. He said, happy are those who are poor in spirit. So he's revealing that it's actually when we acknowledge our need for God that we've entered into an opportunity to be happy because once you've acknowledged your need, God can fill it. But if you have a lid on your heart or you're covering who you are or you're really uh, just pretending to not need God, then you're going to find yourself lacking in true joy, and you're going to always look, all of us, myself included, we're always looking for the outside happiness. Meanwhile, the answer was in if I just started my day, started my morning, and throughout the day just said, Lord, I'm poor in spirit, I need you. And I've been practicing that this week, even in troubled times or difficult situations I've had to face, and I've got to say, I felt happy even when things weren't good. Even when things were uneasy and not, not, not feeling like they're all working out, I sensed God's joy in my heart as I said, I need you. Just in acknowledging that, let alone all the other beautiful things that we learned last week in the Beatitudes. And so here today, we want to move into this next section on the Sermon on the Mount because he teaches us how to be happy. And then there's no gap in it, but so often we disconnect Scripture and uh, remove it from different sections. But he teaches all these amazing things about how to be happy. And then he says these words, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So he goes from teaching us how to be happy, which is to do with your inner happiness. He, he's really focused on, on you, the listener. He's saying, listen, if you can hear me on these Beatitudes, if you can practice these and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal them in your heart and to surrender to my way of being happy, inside you're going to start to come alive and feel joyful and you're not going to need any outside substance to get that joy. And you're going to have this, this understanding that he is all you need, but he's not all you get when you follow him. 
your, your outside world starts to transform because you don't have debt on the inside. Everything that happens on the inside through the Beatitudes starts to manifest like a garden where you've planted seeds. The Beatitudes are like eight seeds that you plant in the garden of your heart. And all of a sudden, these different flowers and these different bouquets and these different fruit trees and all this stuff starts to flourish. And you may not see it yet from last Sunday, but if you keep planting and you keep watering, I'm telling you, you're going to have a garden in your heart that is so amazing and so beautiful that New Yorkers are going to run in and they're going to be like, amazing, this is, this is so beautiful. What, where, where, do you, where do you get this from? You say, oh, it's from, it's from Jesus. And so once you have that on the inside of your life and the seeds start to manifest, he's saying, Listen, the next section is all about influence. So if the Beatitudes were about character and inner happiness and who you are and where you draw your sense of worth and value from, now we look at how do you influence people. And the reality is, is if you're living out the Beatitudes, if, you're the, if you have inner happiness that the world cannot take, you will be salt that the world cannot understand, yet they will feel different when they're around you. You will be light that illuminates the image and the power of God. Influence is defined as this, the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone. Whether you know it or not, you have the capacity. Across all locations, would you say capacity? capacity. Now, your capacity grows. As a child, we have a certain capacity. As we get into university or workplaces or in church life, you grow in leadership. And so it's our job to continue to surrender to God who stretches our capacity. The way that capacity is enlarged is actually through trials. So the leader or the person or the follower of Jesus, you can be salt, but you might be like a mini, you know those travel salt shakers on the airplane? You're a little Delta sh uh, salt shaker. You gotta try to figure out how to open those things, and then it just goes everywhere. And you're like, oh man. And you just salt bay it, and it's just like, it's all. And so, but the reality is, is yes, you have a current capacity that w where you say, Lord, this is my capacity. And then you open up, and He fills you with inner happiness. And then when people interact with you, you either preserve them and, and, or, you, or you enhance flavor in their life. But the reality is that we wanna be a church that doesn't stay at our current capacity. So the, the more we're going through trials or situations and challenges and we continue to go back to, oh, that's right, blessed are the poor in spirit for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. And we understand that it's our need for God that enters into a, a true inner happiness, not our sense of abundance every second, but rather our acknowledgement of a need for him. In those trials, all of a sudden your capacity, you become like one of those huge wood you know, salt shakers, just massive ones. Or you actually become one of those Costco salt shakers. Like, like you, you actually enlarge so you can have more of effect in people around you. And so I want to encourage you, firstly, that every single person has a capacity to influence. Even if it's one person, it matters. And here's the thing. Both your reaction or your non-response is actually causing influence. When you're kind of ashamed about the gospel or you don't enter into worship or praise or your resistance to giving, these things have an influence even though you're not engaging. Non-engagement is still an influence. A lack of faith is still an influence. So if you profess to believe in Jesus yet you don't actually live it out, you're influencing but maybe not the way that Jesus has called us to. And so here in this next part after the Beatitudes, Jesus says these words. Let's read it together. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? He's saying if, if salt ever loses its salt, you can't put the salt back in. There's no, you know, you, salt, saltless salt can hide in salt, but it's only the other salt that's making it salty. <laughs> Tweet that. <laughs> Can't wait for the, the Instagram image for that quote. <laughs> it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. 
So the, 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 the result of salt that lost its saltiness was only there to be trampled upon. And, and we don't want to be a church or a culture that professes Jesus, but people just walk over us because we've lost our saltiness. We want to stand out in a culture that needs to see who Jesus is, needs to see the flavor and the image of God preserved in every way. And it says, you are the light of the world. So it's interesting, two really clear pictures for you. If you're, if you're trying to figure out, who am I in this earth? You're, what, what's my identity? Listen, when you're abiding in Christ, it's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. This idea of even this sense of identity is so overdone, more it's about focusing on who Jesus is. And yes, you have personality and uniqueness and, and traits, and that's awesome. That's all enhanced when you're around Jesus. Because here's the thing. Jesus is talking like this because he is the salt and light. Hello? <laughs> like, every room he walks in, man, it just gets more flavorsome. Like, he's never at a dinner table. I was like, man, this dinner's quite bland. <laughs> Conversation is not really going well. No, he, he is engaged. He's not the person at the table judging Zacchaeus. He's not over like, look at those, those people. Oh, my gosh, sinners. No, he's like, hey, come over here. I want to know about you. Tell me your story. It's salty, yo. Like, like some, some Christians are just like stand off and I want to see how you perform and see your... That, that's so unsalty. It, it, it's just so, it's so dark. You should be revealing, man, there's, there's worth in people. Find out their story. Stop talking about yourself. Ask them a question. Like, okay, yeah. We'll do, we'll, we'll do a series on that later. It's called Stop Talking About Yourself. I feel like it's a Seinfeld episode, you know, anyone, close talkers, and, you know, anyway, all right, showing my age, anyway, all right, um, so, you are salt and light, any room he walked into, he lit up, he, he would never be at a dinner party on Wednesday, and you wouldn't, uh, wouldn't feel the sense of warmth and glow, I don't know about you, there's something so beautiful, like, in uh, walking through a town, or seeing beautiful shop windows, and there's a light that kind of warms the atmosphere, warms the street. Jesus, he, he lights up any room he's in. He's always bringing warmth and illumination of truth and illumination that you can be happy, that you can actually find joy in him. He, he's not trying to squash the light. He's trying to bring the best out in you. Jesus is the salt and light. And he says, people don't put a lamp under a basket. And yeah, that's what the church does so often. And we do it to each other by, by our lack of encouragement or, or our, our lack of really calling out the best in each other. He says, rather, put your light on a stand. Maybe this doesn't necessarily relate to us as much anymore because we just flick on a light. We don't even you know, think about where that power is coming from. We don't even think about what, what it costs and all the work that happened behind the scenes to generate that light. But for these people listening, they understood that if they didn't have some oil in their light and they didn't have a long enough wick, then their house would be dark. It was a real thing. They were trying to, trying to cook, trying to eat, trying to engage. But as soon as that light was put on the stand, all of a sudden in that house there was connection. In that house, there was relationship. In that house, there's friendship. It's very difficult to connect with someone in the dark. It's very difficult to understand how they're feeling in the dark. But as soon as that light goes on, all of a sudden there's illumination. And that's exactly what you are called to be. Don't hide who God has called you to be. Put your life on a stand. Live with good works. Live with salt. And light, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus is saying some challenging stuff here. I'd love for you to maybe take this down and maybe think about it for yourself. But a disciple of Jesus who does not live like a disciple of the kingdom, remember the Beatitudes, we don't live according to the happiness that the kingdom provides through Jesus. What will happen is that our worth is lost. Because what worth are we to a dark and hurting and lost generation when all we're doing is getting our happiness from the same places that they are? 
See, what makes you salty and what makes you light is the fact that you can be full of joy even if you've gone through loss. And I'm not talking about just emotional joy. I'm talking about you have a hope. You have a life on the inside of you. So Jesus is challenging us. Have we lost our soul? Is our light invisible to others? Or do we actually help people see who he is? Now, when we think about soul, it had different purposes for this time. But one of the main reasons salt was so important, which is kind of lost on us as well, because we preserve things. We still use salt to preserve, but we can preserve things in all sorts of ways. But for them, this was so vital because their, their food and their meat would go off really quickly because they didn't have the same refrigeration process that we have. They couldn't freeze things. And so again, when he's talking about salt, it would have impacted them in a big way. But we got to understand that we as a church, across all our locations, across our dinner parties, you as an individual, even as a visitor today, I want to encourage you today that you are the salt of the earth, which means wherever you go, you preserve anything that looks like Jesus. So you see something. See, here's, here, let me just caveat that. The, the reality is, is that we only preserve things once they're in church. Like, like we only, like Christians, we like, oh, when, when, when someone's saved. Why, why would a generation want to be saved when we don't value them before they're saved? And so we celebrate our own, which is good. We should do that, but we should celebrate all of God's kids. And if you see someone being kind, preserve it. Don't be like, oh, they don't know the truth. Well, they're kinder than you are just then, for real. Check yourself. <laughs> like, like, we just we pull down. We have lost our saltiness. We can't celebrate anything that looks like Jesus because we feel like we're doing something wrong. No, if it looks like Jesus, if it carries the character. Why? Because they are also, guess what? They are also image bearers. You're not the only one. I'm not the only one. Just because I'm a preacher, I'm, I'm not the only one that has the image of God. No, every single human being on this planet has the image of God. And our job is to bring the flavor out and preserve anything that looks like it. And where there's lack, you can add salt so that they can see, oh, there's more. There's more than just good works. There's actually grace. There's, there's more than, than, than just whatever they're doing, there actually is more. And the, the light and the salt reveals and draws out the image of God in our generation. There are so many things right now in New York City that look like Jesus that don't yet profess Jesus. And we just got to connect the dots. We are ambassadors of Christ. We are citizens of heaven. We have shown up as salt and light. We are born again from, from heaven into earth, and we are now representing a new way of life, and we get to connect people to their Savior and reconcile them to God, but they won't see God if we're always pushing people down or saying that they're not good enough. No, th that, that's God's job. The Holy Spirit is really good at convicting. The Holy Spirit is really good at revealing. We should never water down truth. We should never deviate from what is godly. We should never deviate from holiness and purpose. But the reality is, is there are things in New York City right now that you should celebrate. But let me tell you, as a church, we need a better job at celebrating also what God's doing here. We need to shine the light and say, hey, here's a church. Here, here, here are people that are going for God. Look, look at what God's doing. Don't be someone that hides the light of the church, that you're passionate on Sunday, but you, you're not actually revealing who he is during the week. Be the same light as you are here as you are on Monday. Be salt and light. If you believe it, come on, just give God a hand if you believe. Come on, clap like you're salt and light. Come on, clap like you're salt and light. And life. Jesus has changed more people than anyone because he's salt and light. And our job, as I said, is to preserve all that is good. And the presence of light is so, so powerful. I remember um, Georgie and I were in New Zealand. This is years ago. We were youth pastors in Sydney, and we we're going to this youth camp and preaching at this uh, getaway kind of youth camp. And the, the youth pastor, who's still a dear friend of ours today, which is actually a miracle, and um, he's awesome, and he sat us down. We just flew in from Sydney. It was quite late. We just had some dinner. He said, oh, we got one more surprise tonight. 
and we're thinking, man, we're quite tired and, you know, just had dinner and we're thinking, oh, maybe he's got some dessert, you know, it's like, ooh, wow. And he said, actually, tonight we're going to take you night canyoning. And I'm like, oh, well, I'd never heard of it, night canyoning. I'm like, I'm imagining like the Grand Canyon. Night, like I'm like, what, what's night canyoning? He begins to describe what night canyoning is, which is that you hike up a mountain in pitch black and then go down a river full of rocks and cliff jumps and under logs and swim through caves in pitch black. <laughs> and the water's freezing. So Georgie begins to cry. I'm trying not to cry, um, but I'm welling up. And, and I, I honestly, I was so scared, so freaked out. And I'm like, is this like an organized thing? Like this is like a, he's like, yeah, we've organized it. <laughs> I knew it was going to be trouble. So, so sure enough, we hike up there and we, and we go through this whole process. And it is freaky. Like it starts off kind of casual, but it, immediately you're just freaked out. The water is icy cold. And, and he tells us a few kind of tips like, listen, you, the, the key is you got to keep moving because you can't go back up. Like there's certain cliff jumps that you can't climb back out. And he told us after some, some horror stories after, of course. Uh, and so there's this one quite big jump. It's almost like a 40-foot free fall into pitch black. So you can't see anything and it's in into water like this is now you understand why we're crying okay so <laughs> little to say we have not done it since <laughs> and so he said to us after oh yeah there's this w one young lady and she she would not jump and so we have to tell people there's a certain point we will push you off the cliff because the people treading water below will get hypothermia and there's no way to get out. And they can't airlift you out because it's too tree, you know, like, wow, this sounds like a brilliant idea. It's genius. <laughs> and so we, we go through the, the whole thing. But the thing that got me through was I had a little flashlight. And every time you'd get to a cliff, you would throw the flashlight because they're waterproof flashlights. You would throw the flashlight and you'd kind of get a feeling and a, a sense of where, the, where your death was. <laughs> <laughs> But it's amazing that because we're around so much light and we, we have the scripture and, and maybe you're in a dinner party or you've grown up in a church home, that we forget how dark it is out there. That we forget that, that our little bit of light, our little bit of a smile or reaching out, having a conversation with someone that's homeless and loving on someone and going that extra mile and, and just bringing the sense of warmth and light could help someone in their darkest moment. Right now, there is a single mom out there waiting for someone to help her. You're going to encounter people, and it's, I know it's hard sometimes to figure out who to help, but right now there are people in your circles, at your workplace, people on your block, in your neighborhood, and sure, you can't do everything, but just because that's a statement doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything. Just because the, the need seems overwhelming and looks like, well, what is this little flashlight going to do in the middle of... Uh, what's this little flashlight going to do in the middle of a dark canyon for someone? But let me tell you, it, it helped a lot. Come on, it helped a lot. Come on, I'm preaching better than you're responding, praise God. And, and so, like, be, be a light in your workplace. You, I'm telling you, some days you're just going to feel like, oh, man, just a little flashlight. Man, it feels dark today. And you're going to be tempted. You know what? I'm going to turn my light off. I, you know what, it doesn't really matter what my morals or my ethics are. It doesn't, you know, what, what does it matter? I mean, someone else can salt this steak. You know, someone else can add flavor. Someone else can preserve that. Someone else, but we, the enemy would love for you to put a bushel, a cover on your light. He wants you to turn it off, but Jesus says, no, turn it up full maximum brightness because guess what? If we all put our light together, people are going to notice. That's why we do it at concerts, y'all. <laughs> it makes a difference. It, it makes an impact. And so your life will make a big difference as you shine for Jesus. And so I, I want to refer back to last week. I want to double down on the inner happiness that you can get through Jesus, through the Beatitudes, but draw out how Jesus was actually saying, listen, in the Beatitudes is your salt and light. 
When you live these out, not just let them be a message from last Sunday, but when you live them out and you get your happiness, not from materialism, not from the relationship, not from sex, not from power, not from fame, not from likes, you're sending a message of salt and light that impacts and influences a generation. But if you're getting your happiness from everywhere else, where everyone else, I'm telling you right now, you've lost your saltiness. And today's a day to repent and come back and say, God, restore unto me a salt that cannot come from me, but comes from you. Restore to me the light of my salvation. Restore that joy and that happiness so that I might shine with the glory of God. In the middle of night canyoning, I'm telling you, I, okay, here, here's, a, here's a, a side story that just really encourage you. I'd never abseil before, and the last thing that you got to do is abseil down a steep waterfall. It, abseil down it and, and lean. Anyone know abseiling? Anyone? No. Traversing here. Cultural ministry right here. I just broke through all the cultural background. It's great. Traverse. Is that what you call it? Rock, you know the thing with rock climbing? Queens, help me out. Manhattan's not helping me. <laughs> Belay. I learned something. Thank you, everyone. Belayed down. Okay. All right. Anyway, I'm going down this, and, 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 and the, the key is that you have to lean back. And I, I've never done it before. And it's pitch black, and there's water spraying like a full-on waterfall in my, in my eyes, and it's a free fall down to jagged rocks, and the instructor is saying, lean back, and I'm literally leaning forward, clinging to the side, and, and as a miracle, I survived, because all the weight was on him, and he's like, lean back, that's a whole nother message, and, and literally, I, I, I didn't lean back, I, th I think I almost broke the guy's back. And, and we, we, we survived that moment. But then the instructor turned to my wife, Georgie, and said, I've never seen worse belaying in my life. <laughs> so there you go. But, but the, the reality is, is that in the Beatitudes, we need to understand that when we show a need, when, we're, when we think, oh, man, I've got nothing left, that's when you can shine the brightest. Isn't it the scripture that says, in our weakness, he is strong? But we think we've got to have it all together so we can be a light. But actually, you get brightest when, man, how did you make it through that situation? Hey, hey, how did, how did you get through that case? How, how did you walk through that debt? Hey, hey, tell me about that time. Hey, when you went through that breakup, you stayed in church. Hey, hey when, when, when things weren't working out with the job and you thought it was a dream job and you got let go... You are still lifting your hands in worship. See, isn't it interesting that when things get bad, we tend to now justify wrong behavior. And we lose our saltiness. We lose our light. But here's the thing. When you say, I need God, when I acknowledge my need, that's when I begin to preserve the need for God in this generation. Because we live in a generation right now that says we don't need God. We live in a generation in the Western world in New York City where you can go day after day and not really open the scriptures. But let me ask you, if you were living in a slum in Manila, the largest slum in the world, I visited there, a million people stacked on top of each other and met moms and dads that are trying to raise their kids and all they have is a tattered up Bible. And I said to them, hey, could you live a day without this? They would say, no, not, not one day. Why? Because their, their, their poverty revealed what life is truly about. But your materialism is revealing what you're relying on. And so we need to get back to this place and realize it's not your wealth that shines. It's not your fame that shines. Yes, be wealthy for kingdom purposes. Yes, be famous and give glory to God. But how many people get famous and don't give glory to God? How many people get famous and just say a thing at the end of their championship, but don't live like salt and light? And I'm not judging anyone. I'm just saying, don't aim for something, but don't develop the character that is needed for when you get it. So happiness and where we get our happiness is so important now because when you get the job and when you become the CEO and when you're on Broadway, you want to know where your happiness is already from. It needs to be from the glory of Jesus Christ because when the glory of man shines upon you, 
Is your light brighter than the glory of God? Is it shine in a dark place or is it extinguished by temptation and the pull of power and fame? But you bring light to others who don't know what to do with their needs. See, there's a generation out there that, that when their need rises and they're so successful and they're thinking suicidal thoughts and you can share, hey, I went through something similar. Hey, I, I, I went through depression. I went through this situation. And you reveal that, hey, the answer was not more of whatever, but I discovered it in Jesus. I discovered my hope in him. And that's where mourning is so powerful. Dealing with the loss of things well will help a generation, and you'll end up preserving and adding flavor and revealing the image and the glory and the hope and the love of God. Happy are those who care deeply about the loss of those things that truly matter. See, when you mourn over, uh, when, you, when you fall or you fail or there's a sin, but if you've lost the ability to repent, because this is where this word comes from, is, is repenting of things and, and you actually are, are remorseful about certain things in your life, you're revealing that the way to get comforted is through Jesus, not more sin. Because isn't it interesting, when you sin, you try to add sin to the sin to comfort you from the last sin. Okay, any honest believers here? Like, no, I do not relate. I have no idea what you're talking about. No, I never do that. I don't even think I've sinned before. The reality is, is that when we actually mourn well, when we say, God, comfort me, and I turn back to you, you're helping a generation preserve their ability to actually come back to him. You're saying what has been lost is worth mourning. See, I'm, I'm mourning right now the, the value of family in our generation. My, my heart aches for the value of fatherhood. My, my ache, my, there's an ache in my heart, and I mourn the loss of value on marriage. And it may not even be popular in my own congregation, but I'm letting you know that there are many churches over the last seven years, even in New York City, that are deviating from the word of truth, deviating from the Bible itself, and, and watering this down so we don't have to mourn. We don't want to mourn. We want to, oh, it's all good. Everyone's happy. Let's just move on. Nothing to see here. Thank you. Thank you. And we water down truth until there's no light left. Yeah. And how, when it gets real dark, if you're on, if you're on a, a, an airplane or you go through a, t- a troubling time, people are calling out the name Jesus that have never, never even met him. Why? Because there's hope in the name of Jesus. He's the only name that we can cry out to. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the Prince of peace. He's the light of the world. But if we water him down, what do we have to offer? And if, we're, if it's all about us and another brand and another theme and another person, another worship leader, another pastor, if it's about us, then we're not showing them who Jesus is. It's about the church. We are the body of Christ. He is the head. He is the great shepherd. He is the one we look to. But we actually reveal that when we actually mourn those things that are lost in society. We don't stay in grief, but we acknowledge, hey, something's lost, but we can restore it. Not through judgment and just political powers, although it might be helpful to lobby in certain ways and we use these mechanisms in order to value and create society's safety for family and marriage and things. But that's also not the answer. Because Jesus didn't have that with the Roman Empire. Jesus didn't have all the laws that he wanted in place that reflected the kingdom laws. And he didn't lobby Caesar to make it happen. He was the salt and light. And he gave his life and brought the kingdom of God through that. Maybe it's time for the church to give their life again. Maybe it's time for the church to pick up their cross again. Maybe it's time. Come on, anyone here today. Maybe it's time for us to stop losing our saltiness and turning our light down. See, you got me spitting up in here in Manhattan. Let's go. Happy are those who have strength under control. That we would understand that it's not just because we have power that we can bring about outcomes. But in fact, the ability to control power, which Jesus understood, he was so powerful. He could have called angels to fight for him while he's on the cross and and, and defeat all of his enemies in just a moment. He could have called it out. But he resisted. He had a meekness because he knew there was a better way. He wanted to see the salvation of his kids more than just proving his power. And sometimes we try to prove ourselves and end up 
hurting others. And we need to understand today that meekness is a salt and a light in a generation that's full of ego and pride. Meekness preserves the reality that we don't need power to possess what we want. See, this is hope for the, for the single mom. This is, this is hope for the, for the person that's going through injustice right now. Why? Because they feel powerless. But if the church says you need power to power through, then what hope do we give the world? What salt and light do we give them? But when we show the way of Jesus, when we feel like we have no power, yet His power is revealed through our weakness, we give hope to all those that feel weak. But if we're just using our power and exerting our emotions and exerting our title, then we will miss the the hope that we bring to those that don't have power. Those that feel like they have no voice, sometimes the best thing to do is not to defend yourself. Sometimes the best thing to do is take the meek pathway and you'll end up lighting up the world. People will see a better way. Oh my gosh, I don't need to have all the power in order to influence society. We, we are, as a church, and the churches around the city, whether we know it or not, we're influencing the very nature and character of this beautiful city, even if people don't want to recognize it. They won't even recognize our power. They say, you know, I tell people I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor, and they're like, cool, cute. Like, it, it's, you know, some, some people are interested, but it's not because I have, if I said, oh, I'm, I'm such and such. Oh, wow, fascinating, yes. And so, it, because of power. But my seemingly powerlessness as a pastor looks like I can't actually light up the world or preserve or add value. But actually through the gospel, through meekness, I can see lives impacted. I can show security even when there's insecurity. I can show confidence and hope even when it looks like there is no hope. Why? Because I have eternal life in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Oh, 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 oh,